Hello, everybody. This is Mallory Flowers on behalf of Jennifer Schaus and Associates, and we are coming to you live from Washington, D.C., and welcome to our webinar Wednesday series. Our webinars are held every Wednesday in 2018 at 12 p.m. and 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and our speakers range from accountants to attorneys and other industry professionals. The full schedule for the rest of the year is on our website under the webinar tab. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you have any questions, please contact the speaker directly with the contact info you will see on the last slide. The recordings are on our website underneath the archive webinar tab as well as on our YouTube channel. All right, this is just a quick blurb about us. Jennifer Shelton Associates is based in downtown Washington, D.C., and we help both product and service companies with federal contracting. Our clients are domestic and foreign defense contractors and civilians, and our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles, including the GSA schedule. We can also help you with proposal writing and post-award contract administration. More information about our services and upcoming events can be found on our website. And this is our annual networking event for federal contractors. Uh, you can find more information about this event on the link provided on this slide or also on our website. All right, so we're going to go ahead and dig into today's presentation, which is about debrief disclosures, and our speaker is Ed Delisle. And you can learn more about his background on this slide. Ed, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay, thank you, Mallory. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for uh, listening in today. Our topic for today is debriefings. Uh, what do you really get? There are lots of misconceptions of, uh, out there about what you do, in fact, uh, get or should expect to receive as part of the uh, debriefing process. And that is what we're going to cover today. So, Mallory, if you could advance the slide. All right, for, so first let's talk uh, briefly about what a debriefing is. Uh, a debriefing is an opportunity for an offeror, whether that offeror is successful or unsuccessful, to uh, better understand why an agency has made uh, the selection that it has made. Um, the basis for a, a source selection authority's uh, decision isn't always uh, straightforward and, and uh, understood simply based upon the, uh, the notice that you receive from them. And in situations where a required uh, debriefing is uh, necessary, the, um, the FAR provides guidance in terms of what exactly that source selection authority uh, is required to give to you. And uh, we're going to go through some of that today. In terms of, the, um, uh, the, in terms of when a debriefing is required, most of the time when I deal with it, uh, it's uh, based upon FAR Part 15, and you see a reference to FAR Part uh, 15 on this uh, slide, and that's contracting by negotiation. Uh, there are other instances where a debriefing uh, is required, and we'll talk about that uh, briefly as we go through the presentation today. But generally speaking, we're talking about solicitations that have been issued under FAR Part 15. Uh, in terms of uh, what format the briefings can come in, based upon uh, the FAR, as you see, they can be uh, oral, in person, in writing, or uh, by any other method acceptable to the contracting officer. And there, in fact, there are a wide variety of options uh, available. Uh, one of the written varieties that I've seen more of uh, of late are PowerPoint presentations that a source selection authority will assemble and uh, present to um, mostly unsuccessful offerors, but not always. So that the offerors can better understand uh, their thought process. I, I tend to like those, uh, particularly where they're provided ahead of time, which sometimes does happen because it will uh, assist the, um, the offeror in formulating questions to ask uh, at the point in time, hopefully, when you get to speak to someone. You don't always get to speak to someone. Uh, you should always request uh, the ability to have a, uh, a give and take. If you can get uh, one that's in person, that's the best kind. The give and take uh, person to person is always preferred as opposed to any uh, sort of other communication that you might have with a source selection uh, authority. But I will tell you that uh, in my experience, uh, as time has progressed, it's probably the least likely alternative of all the alternatives that is an in-person uh, meeting with a source selection uh, authority. The most likely uh, type of debriefing you'll get is one that's in, in writing. Hopefully it's not solely in writing and, and there is some give and take, but the uh, option is the source selection authorities based upon what we see here uh, in the FAR. So the recommendation would be if you're in a, uh, for example, a FAR Part 
uh, 15 situation where there is a required briefing that you uh, request an in-person meeting and at the very least if that's uh, denied you're uh, permitted to have some sort of an oral uh, debriefing where there's a, uh, there's a bit of give and take. Now if you can uh, advance the slide. Okay, so when is the debriefing required? We talked a few moments ago about uh, FAR Part 15 and the NEC reference to it here. And the first bullet, you'll see uh, both a reference to FAR Part 15 and FAR Part 16.5. These are the two um, situations where a uh, where you're going to find that the debriefing is in fact required. Uh, indefinite delivery contracts, which includes task or delivery order contracts. Uh, which result in a war that exceeds $5.5 million uh, are, are what will result in a required debriefing if you're under uh, FAR Part 16.5, uh, which specifically pertains to definite delivery contracts. Um, Pre-award debriefings are also available, as you see uh, here, uh, under FAR Part 15, to the extent that a competitive range is established and an offeror has been excluded from that competitive range. And, the debriefings under FAR Part 15, which uh, are available to an offeror, offeror can be uh, sometimes pre-award, uh, all the time post-award. And uh, the pre-award debriefing uh, will arise, as we say here, based on uh, FAR Part 15.505 uh, in situations where an offeror is excluded from uh, a competitive range. In terms of timing, uh, a debriefing is required in one of the two situations that you see in uh, bullet one or two, uh, and if the request is made within three calendar days after notification of either the exclusion from the competitive range or notification of an award. Again, that's under uh, FAR Part 15. Now, as we'll talk about uh, momentarily, if you don't strictly follow the uh, timing parameters set forth in the FAR, then you can create problems for yourself to the extent that you wish to uh, protest an award at some point in the future. Okay, Mallory, can you advance the slide? Okay, so uh, in terms of pre-award and post-award, a pre-award uh, debriefing uh, based upon FAR Part 15.505B uh, should be held as soon as practicable, uh, <laughs> whatever that means, right? So it's, it's, it's as quickly as the source selection authority or the contracting officer uh, can schedule that debriefing uh, in a pre-award situation, uh, there is the possibility that that, that, that debriefing could get uh, pushed until uh, an actual award is made. That's permissible under the FAR. Typically, you're going to receive that debriefing uh, relatively soon after it's requested. Again, it doesn't have to be, and it's, uh, it's, it's all premised upon what's in the best interest of, of the government at that time. But generally speaking, you can expect that in a pre-award debriefing situation where a uh, competitive range has been established and uh, you, if you're the offeror, have been excluded, you can expect to receive that, generally speaking, uh, not too terribly long after you've requested it. Uh, in a post-award situation, it's a little bit more precise. As you see here, post-award debriefings under FAR Part 15 should should, uh, to the maximum extent practicable, be held within five days after the offeror's uh, request. It's not a strict uh, requirement, this five-day period of time, but generally speaking, uh, source selection authorities or contracting officers uh, like to stick to that because there is uh, the distinct possibility that, of course, the longer that you wait, the longer it becomes before uh, the contract that you wish uh, to move forward actually does so and moves forward and work is done. So uh, in most situations, while that five-day uh, period of time is not strict, it's not missed by uh, too terribly much simply because the, the government wishes for that contract to proceed. Okay, Mallory, if you can advance the slide. Okay. When are they not required? Okay, so there are lots of misconceptions about when a debriefing uh, is and is not required. Uh, we just went through the situations where it is required, and those are the situations where it's required. Um, very often, uh, offerors are confused, and it's not their fault, based upon what a solicitation may say. Many times in a solicitation, it may make references uh, to FAR Part 15-like language. 
Uh, you might see things like trade-off or best value or things like that, um, but you need to make sure that it truly is a FAR Part 15 solicitation uh, such that a, a debriefing is actually required because it's not always uh, required, only in those situations that we've identified. There are um, sort of types of debriefings that could be required as a part of FAR Part 8 and FAR Part 13, which you see uh, referenced here. And some think that, in fact, debriefings are required under FAR Part 8 uh, or FAR Part 13, uh, FAR Part 8 being um, sources of supply contracts and 13 is, of course, simplified acquisitions. Uh, in fact, that's, that's a misconception that is uh, incorrect. Uh, what you are entitled to uh, under FAR Part 8 and FAR Part 13 are what the, those particular FAR provisions refer to as brief explanations of the basis for the award decision. It's not the same thing as a debriefing. It's important to understand that there is a distinction. Uh, what we're talking about under FAR Part 8 and FAR Part 13 are much more abbreviated versions of uh, sort of how the, um, the agency made its uh, award decision. And certainly, you're not entitled to the type of information uh, that you would be under a FAR Part 15 or FAR Part 16.5 where applicable, uh, to, you know, as far as that's concerned. Um, it's also important to understand that with respect to FAR Part uh, Parts 8 and 13, that even though you can request a brief explanation of the basis for an award decision, the impact on making that request on the timeline uh, within which uh, you can protest, assuming that you have uh, the right to do so under those circumstances, it, it's, it's not affected by requesting that brief explanation as it would be in a situation uh, where you're required to be provided with a debriefing under uh, FAR Part 15 uh, and FAR Part 16.5. Mallory, can you advance the slide? Okay, so what do you get out of a debriefing? And let's start to sort of get into some of uh, the meat of what we're going to talk about. So well, you, you get hopefully some information about, particularly if, if you are unsuccessful, about why you are unsuccessful. You want to be able to do a better job the next time. And uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but one of the things you want to make sure that you always walk away from a debriefing with is a better understanding as to uh, what you can do to be more competitive. That's uh, first and uh, foremost. Another uh, important reason to ask for a debriefing is to better understand that there's basis to protest. Uh, you may feel in your gut when you receive your notice of award uh, if you're unsuccessful that, boy, I tell you, it, it just did not seem or does not seem right to me that I was not awarded uh, a contract. And, and that's fine to think that way, but once you go through a debriefing, you may certainly think something very different. So going through a debriefing is an important part of understanding whether or not there is a basis uh, to protest. It's, it's also uh, an opportunity to uh, hopefully in person or at the very least um, over, uh, over the phone, market your company. You want the people on the other end, the agency, to understand who you are, what you're all about, why you care. Uh, the fact that you want to do a good job, that you want to work for that agency. So it's also a marketing opportunity. And, and sort of keeping that in mind and <clears throat> along those lines, when you go through a debriefing process, you might be very disappointed if you're unsuccessful uh, that you did not receive uh, an award. But you need to sort of overcome how you may feel uh, as a result of not getting an award once you get to the debriefing process. Why? Because you don't want to come off as belligerent particularly uh, if it's a, an organization, an agency that you wish to do business with uh, in the future. Uh, it, it's a marketing, a part of the marketing aspect of what you must do as a government contractor, which does not differ uh, very much at all from what uh, folks would deal with in the commercial world. Sometimes that's lost on folks as they go through this process, but it's something important to, uh, to keep, on mind, uh, keep in mind. Uh, Many times I recommend uh, to my clients, and generally speaking, I always recommend that even if you win, go through a debriefing process because you want to know what you did right. Uh, most of the time when you go through a debriefing process, you're trying to understand what you did wrong. Uh, understand what you did right because that's just as important. In fact, you can argue that it's even more important because it resulted 
in uh, why you won, and it could lay the groundwork for future uh, wins, and that's very important. Okay, Mallory, if you could advance the slide. Okay, so now we're going to uh, break down what you uh, what you can expect or should expect as part of the debriefing process into two parts. First, we're going to uh, discuss what you can expect as part of a pre-award debriefing, and then we're going to shift focus uh, to post-award debriefings. Okay, so generally speaking, as part of a pre-award debriefing, so you were, uh, this is a FAR Part 15 situation, and you were excluded from the competitive range, or it could perhaps be a phased uh, solicitation where uh, sort of like a no-go, go, no-go, go, no go, and uh, you got a no-go after phase one for one reason uh, or another, and you want to better understand exactly why. So you've uh, uh, requested the briefing pre-award, and hopefully you'll uh, you'll come to some understanding as to as to why you were eliminated from the competition. Uh, as part of a pre-award debriefing, an agency is required um, to discuss the um, how it evaluated the significant elements of what the offeror provided in the hopes of being selected, okay? In, in terms of what you need to do to better understand that, before you actually go into the debriefing as you prep for it, the number one thing you need to do is to go back into the RFP and make sure you fully and completely understand the selection criteria because you were not selected based upon that criteria and the selection process was premised upon the criteria that was outlined in that uh, solicitation. So you, you have to know it and understand it before you go into the debriefing. And um, you want to make sure that you fashion the questions that you ask. Again, this is assuming that you have the ability to ask questions, uh, either in person or on the phone. Uh, you want to understand exactly what to ask. The what to ask is going to be premised upon what's in the solicitation. And of course, uh, that's going to correspond or should correspond in some way, shape, or form to what you submitted. Okay, so make sure. Uh, that you understand what the solicitation asks for so you can gear your questions uh, toward the agency uh, based upon uh, what's in there and then, of course, what you, what you provided. And what they're required to do in response uh, to your questions is provide uh, answers to anything that's relevant, uh, as we say here, about whether the source selection procedures and the solicitation app applicable regulations and other authorities were followed in the process of eliminating the offeror from the competition. What does it mean? It means did they apply the rules the way that they were written? Okay, and that's really uh, from an, uh, looking at it from an overarching perspective, whether it's peer word or post word, that's really what you're looking for. You want to uh, you want to know number one, did the source selection authority uh, use the rules that were identified in the solicitation and then apply them uh, accurately and correctly based upon what you uh, submitted. Did the agency follow its own rules in eliminating you from the competition? That's the uh, the bottom line. And you're entitled to a reasonable, reasonable response to any question that falls underneath that, uh, that umbrella. For example, as I mentioned, uh, a phase solicitation process a few moments ago. Uh, let's say you have a two-phase design build under FAR Part 15, and under Phase 1, there's an evaluation of the uh, management team and overall experience of the offeror. And when it comes to experience, the solicitation uh, wanted you to provide at least three projects that you have performed for the federal government of similar size and uh, complexity. Okay, and, they, and uh, these projects had to have been performed uh, over the last five years. You could spend, depending upon the circumstances, a good bit of time trying to understand whether uh, the projects that you provided as part of uh, the experiment factor satisfied what the government was looking for. Uh, there could have been a misunderstanding on your part in terms of what you thought the government was seeking and they, it could have been an, a misunderstanding on their part in terms of what you were presenting. Uh, so that's an example of where you might want to spend your time in asking questions and getting the information uh, that you're entitled to as part of the, um, the debriefing process. Okay, so now this is pre-award. Mallory, if you could advance the slide. 
Okay. Uh, what are they not going to give you as part of uh, a pre-award uh, protest? And there are some misconceptions about some of these things. They will uh, not tell you, or at least they should not tell you. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen sometimes. But what they should not be telling you or disclosing are the number of offerors in total, uh, the identity ranking or evaluation of everybody else. Okay, And, and it's, this is going to be different. Some of this is going to be different once we get to post-award, as you'll see. Uh, what's in somebody else's proposal? Folks always seem to think that that's something uh, that they can uh, get their hands on as part of a debriefing process. It's not, uh, and specifically pre-award, you're not going to be able to um, obtain the content of someone else's uh, proposal. Uh, and as you see in that last bullet, uh, there anything that's privileged or confidential uh, as to somebody else, uh, a competitor, you're not going to be able to access uh, that information. And again, that sort of goes hand in hand with the third bullet uh, relating to other offerors' proposals. Information that's confidential or proprietary to another company will not be something that you as an offeror in a, in a pre-award uh, debriefing will be able to uh, obtain. But to also understand that just because a search selection authority is not supposed to provide some of this information, a lot of times it, it will. You go through a Q&A with, uh, with an agency with a source selection authority and you'd be surprised, particularly if you develop a good rapport, what information uh, you can receive. But certainly I can tell you you should not expect anything like this as part of a uh, pre-award debriefing. Mallory, Mallory, if you can uh, advance the slide, please. And as we uh, shift to post-award uh, debriefings, it, we're talking about some of the same things, but they're, it's spun a slightly different way. As we see here, the government's evaluation of the significant uh, weaknesses or deficiencies uh, in an offer's proposal, if applicable, is certainly something uh, that a source selection authority uh, must disclose as part of a, a post-award debriefing and as part of the Q&A that you hopefully receive uh, as part of the debriefing process, you should be asking about what those significant weaknesses or deficiencies are if you are a, an unsuccessful uh, offeror. And uh, also as part of the um, post-award process, the overall evaluated cost or price, including unit prices if, if it's applicable, and technical rating of the successful offeror, so assuming there was only one offer, or one award rather, that, uh, that particular company's information, and then the information as it pertains uh, to you, as well as your past performance information, uh, you would have the ability to receive all of that information. So how you were rated technically uh, on those evaluation factors that were applicable to the particular solicitation about which you've asked for debriefing, all of that information will become available uh, to you, and you would be able to also see the, uh, the successful offer or the awardees uh, information as well, and so you'd be able to uh, at least understand how how close you were from a technical rating standpoint to uh, becoming the awardee. It's important because it can give you some key information in terms of whether you should or shouldn't protest if that's something that you were thinking might be a possibility uh, at the point in time when you received your uh, notice of award and uh, requested your, your debriefing. Uh, you also will receive or should receive and should ask for the overall ranking of all offerors. Uh, and what you'll be, well, obviously what you'll be able to tell in, in that situation, these things can come in different fo uh, forms. Sometimes uh, the list can become, uh, can come to you embedded uh, as part of a written debriefing or a combination of written oral, and it's embedded in a, uh, in a letter. I've seen that happen uh, before. Sometimes, sometimes the the order can be expressed orally. I've seen it. Uh, I've seen it contained in PowerPoint presentations that have been both provided prior to a debriefing and during, or as part of uh, a debriefing. So they can come in different shapes or forms. But it's it's information that's important to you to understand how your proposal fared relative to everyone else, not just simply uh, from a ranking perspective, not just simply uh, the awardee itself. Okay, Mallory, if you can advance the slide.
Okay, you're required to receive a summary of the rationale for award. Why did the agency give this particular contract to the awardee? Okay, you're required to be provided a summary of the rationale. Uh, for acquisitions of commercial items, uh, the make model of the item to be delivered uh, by the successful offeror. What exactly uh, is the government getting uh, as part of making that, uh, that award? And similar to pre-award, you see here reasonable responses to relevant questions about whether or not the rules that were identified in the solicitation were followed and, uh, and applied appropriately. And we mentioned this uh, with respect to pre-award protests. I'm going to mention it again now. Uh, it, it's even more important relative to post-award uh, debriefings. Know the RFP and understand the, sele the selection uh, criteria. You have to because all of your questions essentially are going to be formulated around what the selection process was identified as and whether or not that selection process was followed as a result of um, the process that the government went through, which resulted in uh, the award being made to one company versus, uh, versus another. Um, practice point. Very important for folks who are going to go through a debriefing uh, process to prepare, not just simply by knowing the RFP, it, it's also uh, recommended that you actually formulate questions ahead of time, okay? Uh, go through your uh, proposal, go through the RFP, begin to formulate questions that you'll want the answer to as part of the debriefing uh, process. One of the questions that you're always going to want to ask, and we made reference to this uh, earlier, um, what were you looking for that I missed? Okay. You want to have an understanding as to what you did wrong, if you're an unsuccessful offeror, of course, uh, so that you don't make the same mistake uh, twice. Because chances are, if you go back to the same agency, uh, they're going to do things the exact same way. The mindset is going to be similar at the very least. And so you'll want to understand what you did so you don't make the same mistake uh, twice. You want to make sure that you formulate questions ahead of time about each uh, individual evaluation factor and sub-factor and uh, make sure you ask why you scored the way that you did. Uh, and, that, and quite frankly, I would do that whether you um, received a high rating or a low rating. So you understand the thought process that the government went through in rating you technically on each of the factors identified in the uh, solicitation. You're going to want to know, uh, was there a trade-off uh, involving cost and technical? Okay, that's something uh, under FAR Part 15 that's done. And if it was done, in, in your case, how was it done? By asking these questions, you could better uh, come up or better understand uh, the not simply the process, but also whether or not a mistake was made as part of the trade-off analysis. And uh, that would be, of course, uh, a situation where you might want to then protest. Uh, did the agency find any red flags in your proposal? You'll want to know that. So if they found you to be a risk in some way, shape, or form, you'll want to ask that question so you know better uh, the next time why they thought you were a risk. Or perhaps it, there was a misconception that you were a risk and they misunderstood something in your proposal. Uh, that happens sometimes and could form the basis for, uh, for a protest. So you want to make sure that you, um, that you prepare fully and completely before you go into a, um, the actual debriefing itself. I'm often asked, should I go in with my lawyer? Normally I say no. I will uh, assist the client in preparing for a debriefing. I will assist the client in putting questions together for that debriefing. Typically I will not uh, be a part of that because an agency, uh, the debriefing itself, because an agency is more willing, generally speaking, uh, to be free with information if counsel is not on the uh, is not a part of this briefing process. Why? Because with a lawyer present, uh, rightly or wrongly, probably rightly, uh, there's a thought that there could be a um, a protest loom. So that's you know a practice point. If you'd advance the slide, Mallory. Uh, what should a source selection authority not disclose? Uh, Many times, and I've been a part of the briefings, despite the fact that I recommend uh, clients to not involve me, I've been involved in plenty. And one of the things that uh, many, many times 
will take place at some point is this sort of uh, comparison, this point by point comparison between uh, the unsuccessful offerors evaluation or technical ratings uh, and those that were received by the awardee. Uh, that sort of uh, point by point comparison analysis is not something that's going to get you very far as part of the debriefing process. If you can, you know, very nicely ask uh, about why certain um, uh, certain eva uh, certain criteria were evaluated the way that they were relative to your own, keeping in mind that you understand exactly how the awardees uh, were rated, it might help you gain a better understanding as to uh, why the awardee was rated more highly than you were uh, when it comes when it, uh, it comes to one particular uh, evaluation factor or another. Um, it's all a matter of how you phrase it. That's why I think that. Uh, Speaking with counsel ahead of time is a good idea. Counsel can help you uh, phrase the, the correct question to ask, or at least one that is more likely to get the response that you want. Um, but this going back and forth tit for tat is not something uh, that is generally uh, permitted as part of a post award uh, debriefing process. And I always remind people you're not going to get your competitor's proprietary uh, information. It's something that uh, folks uh, always hope to to receive, but you know certainly you're not uh, permitted to receive information like that as part of, the, of a debriefing process. So it's something that uh, you absolutely need to keep in mind. Uh, Mallory, if you could advance the slide. When is it over? Well, it's over as soon as uh, the as soon as the if it's an oral presentation. Usually it's it's as soon as the phone hangs up, right? But if it's an in-person meeting, it's, it's it, Typically, it's as soon as the parties part ways, as soon as you leave the agency's office. Um, th there are possibilities, uh, or the, a possibility that the debriefing can extend beyond uh, an initial in-person or on the phone uh, uh, exchange. Um, typically, if it's in writing, it is what it is. If that's all you're going to get, that's all you're going to get. It's over at, uh, at the, you know, upon receipt uh, when you read it. Um, you got to be real careful. There could be questions that you have as a result of what happens during a debriefing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that, that it extends the debriefing process. There has to be an affirmative indication uh, from the agency that it is extending the debriefing to respond to additional uh, requests for information or to answer questions. And if you're not sure, you better get that in writing from the agency so that you don't adversely affect your ability to protest because the time is beginning to tick at that point under a required debriefing. Uh, so you want to make sure that you receive uh, an affirmative response from the agency if, if you wish to extend the debriefing beyond whatever the initial uh, back and forth uh, is during that uh, debriefing process. Okay, and with that, I'm going to advance the slide. Okay, that's it, Mallory. I am done and throwing it back to you. Thank you, Ed. That was a lot of great information, and thank you for sharing your time with us today. I thank you for everybody who joined us. If you have any questions for Ed, please reach out to him um, with the contact information you see on your screen. Uh, next week at noon, we are covering reverse engineering your way into federal contracting, and at 12.30, we are covering proposal processes that win time and again. And this concludes our webinar. Thank you, everybody.